I'm Eric Barnes with The Daily Memphian, and welcome to The Sidebar, a weekly show on the community, arts, culture, and more. Today, we're very pleased to be talking to filmmaker Craig Brewer, so stay with us for a conversation with Craig. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. You came very far to our, our studio, our remote studio on, on 10 in Crosstown. I know, I know. I think I could have counted the steps <laughs> on, on both hands. You recently made a small cameo when you walked by. I can't remember who I was talking to, but uh, uh, it was maybe Willie Bearden or Toby Sells. Anyway, but you walked by. Was that, was that you were doing Yeah, right we were doing this. Yeah, yeah. It was nice. So we said hi, and I think we left it in. I think it's Natalie Van Gundy. Followed my rules and did leave it in. Um, we'll talk about uh, this new series. You're an executive producer. You're, yep. uh, you directed a bunch of the episodes, Fight Night. Um, but I, I want to start with a question. I was thinking about this. Like, we've known each other. We've lived together in Crosstown. We see each other all the time. Again, not live together. Sorry, thank you, Natalie Van Gundy, with a good correction. It's there. a we proximity question. We're breaking news here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, proximity, but we see each other and so on. And right, I've known right. you. I'm, it, I've never asked to interview you, and I was thinking about why. And part of it is I feel like, other than politicians over on behind the headlines who get interviewed all the time, you are got to be far and away the most interviewed person I've ever interviewed. You wow. must do interviews all the time as part of these movies. And so I've yeah. always felt like I would be bothering you. Like, the dude must be sick of talking about all this stuff, in, you know, unless you're promoting a movie or promoting right. a film or promoting a project. And so, but I don't know. Is that like, is that, you must do these cycles of huge numbers of interviews. Well, when you do a, like a press, con, uh, like, a, like a, a junket or something like that, or you're on a tour, yeah. like a publicity tour for it. Yeah, you're, you're talking about a project all day. And and they sit you in a chair and then they bring in like reporter after reporter after right. reporter and they're they're doing like <laughs> question after question so you start feeling really disingenuous but i would say though that um the the special thing that's always been about my career is uh i have always felt uh different about uh local media yeah, uh, I don't feel necessarily like I'm paying the rent uh, and, yeah, right. and, and and fulfilling my obligation to, uh, to sell the product. Yeah, uh, when I talk to people that are uh, are around here, because I still very much feel like I'm part of the community here. Yeah, and I feel safe. I don't. Yeah. I don't feel like a stranger, really. And and I also don't mind talking about what I love about the city and what it does for yeah. me creatively and, and yeah. professionally. And, uh, and, and so, uh, I, I never get tired of talking right. to especially right. local press. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's great. And, and thank you. Um, and whether it's, I guess, you know, separate from the, the promotion of a project, I'm curious with the other interviews you've done as a person who's here in Memphis been interviewed a bunch and what is, what do people in any of these circumstances not ask you that surprises you? And that's a weird question, but like where you sort of go, wow, they've never asked me X. They didn't get to Y. Um, I think that uh, it's, it's the stuff that probably no one wants to talk about and I find interesting, yeah. uh, which is, uh, you know, the things that scare me or, or, fear and you know th things things that uh you would think that i don't maybe have to worry about because i've i've managed some level of success but yeah. I, I find that so much of what being a, a a creative is is fear yeah uh you're you don't know if you're going to have a job after this job you yeah. know, and, and I think that there has always been a sense that like I've had a career. Yes, but I don't think people understand that that's um, the only way that I work is if I come up with something. Yeah. The only way uh, I have a job is if uh, I can I can somehow summon uh, these ideas in my in my brain and in my heart and, you know, and, and make something that people want to see. And then, and then you're, you're dealing with uh, audience reaction. You're dealing with studio uh, uh, financial returns. You're dealing with these things that have a direct correlation with whether or not you're going to work again. Yeah. And there's a lot of it's, there's, it's a lot of being up on a tightrope without a net. Yeah. And you're still, I mean, 
I mean, I think probably many people look at the movies you've done of that have, that from big Hollywood productions and really acclaimed indie and both and all that. Well, you know, he's he goes in and pitches a movie and it's you know it's going to happen. But you're still pitching, and I assume sometimes turned down on things. Oh, and and perhaps that's the thing nobody really talks about is that I mean I would say I'm operating at. One in 15. <laughs> See, that's crazy. But that's really but, what a lot of creatives have to deal with. Yeah. Uh, no, but, you know, I mean, I think it's crazy to people who don't understand. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I've even had, I, I went out to, to breakfast with somebody the other day. And, you know, this next project that I'm going to be doing is something that I wrote and I'll be directing. And, and he said, I, I sure wish you would make more Craig Brewer movies that you write and, and, and also direct. And, and I, I, I said, uh, do, what do you do you think that I've chosen <laughs> not to do you think that right. I'm, I you know it was just right. a preference of mine no that the, the industry right now is going through some radical changes and and the 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 audience is going through a radical yeah. change and there's not a lot of control that uh creatives really have over their career over their work and 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 actually that's what I find so comforting about living in Memphis is that sometimes I'll, uh, in, in these moments where I don't have work, I'll figure out other little smaller right. creative things to do with friends of mine or, yeah. you know, my, my daughter's making short films or my son is putting up, you know, uh, shows with local rap artists or something like that. And I can feel like I've, I've got a place somewhere where I think that if I was in Los Angeles and this is all that I was doing, I'd feel pretty lost Yeah, and I'd feel, I'd, I'd, feel a considerable amount of despair, which I know a lot of artists do because yeah. it's an expensive city and, and then you're not working and, and, but, and yet you're working a lot. You're creating pitches for things that you're spending days and hours doing, and then nothing happens with it. Or when this, what this is what happens a lot, you are paid to write things and for, you know, a studio is developing something you're doing and then that studio chief gets fired and now the new studio guy comes in and he doesn't want to do what the other studio chief did. And so suddenly you're in this limbo yeah. where you can't do anything. And, uh, and so it, it's, I, I, I totally get, and I'm very fortunate and, and grateful right, sure. for what I do, but I don't think people realize, and I have a great amount of sympathy for actors or actresses that haven't worked in a while or you haven't seen. And I always say like, well, that's, that's kind of our fault. It's not their fault. It's their demand is based off of our interest as a viewer, as an audience. Yeah. Uh, again, we're talking here with uh, Craig Brewer, uh, uh, filmmaker um, and writer, director, all those things. Um, and I should remind everyone, I'm Eric Barnes, and this is The Sidebar, uh, which airs every Thursday at 1130 on WXR 91.7 and as a podcast on The Daily Memphian. Um, let's talk some about Fight Night. It opens September 5th on Peacock, the streaming service. Yeah. Um, you uh, are an executive producer on the series and directed, what, half, four or five of the episodes? Um, yeah, I've directed, there's eight episodes. It's okay. an eight-episode arc, and I did the first two, and I did the, the last two. And tell people about it who haven't heard of this, you know, the, the Yeah, well, it's based on a, uh, a podcast that was produced a while back uh, that explored this uh, story that happened in Atlanta back in, in 1970, and this is when uh, Muhammad Ali uh, returned to boxing after... Being suspended for about three years or, or, or being essentially blackballed uh, for his stance on the Vietnam War, like no one would grant him uh, a license to fight. But Atlanta was uh, going through kind of an interesting time uh, in their in their ascension as a as a major city where they realized that they were diverse. They were a diverse city and they started to lean into it and say, we are a. We are a thriving city. We are a black city with black businesses and black interests. And and it kind of started with granting Muhammad Ali his, uh, you know, his uh, his license to to have a, a big, you know, a big return to boxing there. And so that that evening was an opportunity not only for all the businessmen in Atlanta, but also for this the, the hustlers. And there was this guy named Chicken Man who. Uh, who was a numbers runner and he wanted to get in good with all these 
you know, gangsters from New York and Chicago that were coming into the fight. Yeah. And so we threw them a party and, and, uh, and, uh, unfortunately, uh, that party was robbed. It was a big siege of yeah. a big heist. And so we deal with how chicken man and the city kind of dealt with this, this crime that occurred. And, and some of the other, some of the actors and other folks involved, it's a it star line, a huge lineup. Yeah. It's a, it was a little bit of a, you know, kind of a walk down my, my career a little bit. Yeah. Sam Jackson, who I did Black Snake Moan with. I haven't worked with Sam since Black Snake Moan. And he was such an important part of my development and my growth as a director. But uh, able to work with Terrence and Taraji again, who yeah. I got to work on Empire with. But, you know, we, we all kind of started off our kind of a, the, the, the largest part of our careers with Hustle and Flow. And yeah. so it was it was great to yeah. reunite with them. But I've never worked with Kevin Hart and he's yeah. just absolutely brilliant in this. Yeah. Uh, he's not really playing a character that's, that's there to make you laugh. I mean, he is a, he's a fine actor yeah. and, uh, and, and pulls in this electrifying performance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, we're going to go right and do a little housekeeping. Um, again, we're here with uh, Craig Brewer. Um, and I want to talk a bunch about Muhammad Ali with the, with some of the time we have, because I'm fascinated by Muhammad Ali. But um, again, the Sidebar airs here on WYXR 91.7 every Thursday, 1130. It's not just a radio show. It's one of many weekly podcasts we do at the Daily Memphian, including our politics podcast, uh, On the Record, our Memphis Grizzlies podcast with Chris Harrington and Drew Hill, and our food pat podcast, Sound Bites, hosted by Jennifer Chandler. That also airs here on WYXR every Thursday at 11, right before the Sidebar. Um, we also host a Daily Memphian, the podcast version of Behind the Headlines, which we do with the folks over at WKNO every week. All of our podcasts are on the Daily Memphian site, as well as iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, you can get these WYXR shows also at WYXR.org or with the WYXR app. It includes all the talk shows, all archives of the music shows. It's a great way to keep up with what's going on at WYXR. Also, if you're not a supporter of WYXR, it is nonprofit listener-supported radio. And consider becoming a member. You get all kinds of benefits. You get some free stuff, or you can do a one-off donation at the website or on the app. And if you're not a paid subscriber of The Daily Memphian, do consider subscribing. We are the largest newsroom in the region and are also a nonprofit um, newsroom that relies very heavily on your subscriptions. Coming up soon in the coming weeks on the sidebar, we have musician Greg Cartwright um, and Josh Campbell from uh, Spill It. Uh, we also recently had um, Howard Stovall, who's the producer or the, the promoter, I should say, behind the Mighty Roots Music Festival. Um, Willie Bearden, who filmmaker, documentarian, and he wrote a book. Um, and Willie's just a great person to talk to, um, as well as Toby Sells, a uh, writer from The Flyer and frequent guest on Behind the Headlines when we do Journalist Roundtable. He also has recently read a, written a book, and we talked to him about that on the sidebar. I mentioned behind the headlines and coming up this week, we've got Doug McGowan from MLGW, as well as some folks from Protect Our Aquifer, talking about all kinds of things with power, water, the new XAI facility and all that. Um, we've got a show with new school board members on the Memphis Shelby County School Board, as well as a show uh, some two, three weeks out with Marie Fagans, the relatively new superintendent of the school system. And last um, recently had Tina Sullivan, the outgoing uh, um, CEO, executive director, I guess is her official title of the Overton Park Conservancy. It was great to talk to her. Uh, we had a couple of county commissioners, the outgoing um, head of the county commission, as well as the incoming head of the county commission on the show. And Frederick Agee, uh, a, a district attorney from a neighboring counties, talking about the, the fire on Steve Mulroy, our district attorney, and many of the di dynamics there. That, again, it was all on behind the headlines. Last but not least, coming up on September 4th, our, we've got our small business seminar. That's at 3.30 um, at the Botanic Gardens. We've got Beverly Robertson, her son Ryan Robertson. We've got Scott Tashi from uh, City Silo and Monique Williams from Biscuits and Jams. You can go to, just go to uh, Eventbrite, search for Daily Memphian, and you can buy tickets for that. That's September 4th at 3.30. But we're here still with Craig Brewer, the filmmaker. Um, we're about the same age, I think. At Muhammad Ali, I try to describe to people what it was like, the, the kind of star power when I was a kid, when I was five and six, so I was born in 68. He, he was just, especially given how limited media was then, you know, three, three TV stations plus maybe a UHF station, wide world of sports, um, Sports Illustrated, which is so sad to think of what Sports Illustrated has become compared to what it was in terms of what it meant about sports and culture. Muhammad Ali, and he was just 
magnetic. He was so controversial. I didn't understand why my my very prejudiced uncles both loved and hated him. I was like, why don't you just love him? He's funny and interesting, and he's obviously incredible at his sport. I didn't understand the politics, right, you know, when I was young. And he was just, the star power of that guy was amazing. And that, you know, people talk about LeBron, or they talk about Kobe, or they talk about huge star power. You imagine Muhammad Ali with social media. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? You might, Muhammad Ali and the media environment I have now, given how incredibly charismatic and amazing and talented he was. Yeah, I don't think you can, I mean, I, I understand the comparison, but I don't think, like if you were describing him to a younger generation, you can really say, yeah, he's like LeBron because right. he's not. Right. Uh, I would say the closest you could get to Muhammad Ali in terms of what, in terms of explaining what it was on a on a on a, a a cultural level as well as just like how he somehow uh became an obsession with people would be like Eddie Murphy. Ah, I mean, okay. there there was a time where there was comedians but but Eddie like was different. He was young and he was sexy and he yeah. he came out like in a leather outfit like he was a rock star and I I don't know if people just knew what to do with this energy that was just so explosive yeah. where, where it, it transcended even race as well. Because like, I mean, globally people were just like, who is this guy? And listen to what he just said. And, and, yeah. and, and then, you know, movies become like huge box of it. Like they're just see now you can say like, Oh, you know, like Kevin Hart. And it's like, yeah, but you know, there was this time where that did not yeah. exist. And I think that having someone like Muhammad Ali, who not only, I mean, you can get into his ath athleticism, right. But it really was how he engaged with the media and how he was not like what anybody had seen before. I mean, he would call out rounds that he would say, like, I'm going to I'm going to beat this guy in the third round. And and then he's doing the rhymes and he's doing like and, and, and also with all that, speaking his true mind on major political yeah. uh, uh, stances. And I, I find what's interesting that we've dealt with in the show, you know, Don Cheadle's character uh, is based on a on a, a, a real man who was uh, guarding Ali when he was, when he came to Atlanta, but it was also a, a, a police officer uh, with the Atlanta PD and he served. Right. And he's a, a slightly older generation oh, wow. than Muhammad Ali. And I, I think what many people would find interesting about Muhammad Ali is that uh, it's not, uh, yes, you know, African-Americans loved him, but there, there was some conflict you know, because if you if you study like where civil rights were at the at, at the time, so much of of what where where his stance sometimes made it a, a bit tricky was that you know people were saying like, well, we need to show that we're we're equal, and part of that equality means that we need to serve and fight along other white soldiers. That uh, you know, yeah. if the if if white soldiers are to be called, then black soldiers need to be called. But Ali was like pinpointing like really the the the, the the, the wrong that transcended race, even though there was great disparity in terms of people who didn't have money and so forth. But but there was conflict amongst the older guard uh, in terms of African-Americans were like not necessarily like, oh, yeah, I'm on this guy's side. It was a little bit more conflicted than I think history uh, uh, enlightens or affords people about that time of Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I don't know if I'm making sense. Yeah, no, 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 no. I think the other thing that's fascinating about it is about him um, is thinking back on it. And then, I, I mean, many years ago now, I guess when it came out, I watched When We Were Kings, the documentary of the him coming back and yeah. a lot of the history and a lot of the interviews and the fight in the, um, the fight in Africa. Uh, I guess in Nigeria or Kenya, I can't remember which. That's on me. But but what, part of what's fascinating about you know we talk about the politics and the heightened awareness and the and the racism and the prejudice. And here's this man who is at the top of his incredibly violent sport, who had had these moments where he was so charming. Yeah. And and it was just it was not contrived. It would that kind of all that would melt away. And you know famously with Howard Cosell, but with yeah. others, you'd have these moments where he was so funny and so charming and so soft. And you boyish almost, yeah. and that all that was so genuine. I mean, the whole thing of it that he embodied. So, anyway, um, what? Um, 
let's talk about, uh, it's on Peacock, and, and give me your take. I mean, you might be tired of this question, but no. I, I think people aren't, is where we are with streaming. Yeah, and it's I, interesting I, to talk to you, streaming and, and all the services, and interesting to talk to you who, you know, made, you know, indie movies here in Memphis. I assume the first ones were on film. I mean, it was shown in, it was the no, whole. Here's, here, I have an interesting little little uh, moment that was kind of like my, my epiphany uh, during the pandemic. Um, I, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but, uh, you know, there weren't many movies coming out because of the pandemic yeah. and, uh, Netflix was premiering the movies that were going to be premiering on Netflix, like a few weeks in local theaters to kind of help local theaters. Right. Oh, right. Yeah. And so I was sitting in the rain in in my car about to go into the Ridgeway four, uh, Malco Ridgeway four. And I was going to go see Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And I'm sitting in the rain and I'm remembering that back in 2000, I spent like about $1,000 renting a digital projector so I could screen my first film, The Poor and Hungry, in one of their theaters. Oh, wow. For my opening night. Yeah. And then after that, and you got to remember, like, that's when all the movies were shown on film. Yeah. Uh, and there were like two projectors like in a theater. A lot of people don't know what a projectionist usually does, but they, they, they'll put like one reel on one projector. Then there's another reel on another projector. And then they have to be there after about 20 minutes to see the little cigarette burn in the corner. And then they, they switch the projectors. And that's how you go from like this 20 minute into this 20 minute. And they make sure it's in focus. And that's what projectors used to be. And as I was sitting in the rain, I was thinking like, oh man, I remember when the projectors were like that. And then they went to a big plate where now they didn't need a projectionist anymore because it just spooled off this big plate. And then I remember when we went to stadium seating. And then I remember when we went to digital. And then I remember when we went to 3D digital. Yeah, yeah. And now I'm about to go watch a movie that will be on my phone, <laughs> streaming on my phone in another two weeks. Yeah. And to think about that in the that's 20 years of just watching where we have been with our viewing habits and, and how things are, are distributed and how people find out about movies that I really have been through like cataclysmic change. And I don't even think until I, I was sitting there in the rain that I really understood that that's what's happened. You know, you move like an inch every day. And then one day you're like, you look over yeah. there and you're like, Oh wow, wait a minute. Right. Let me see if I understand this correctly. These movies now are not, tangible anymore meaning like there's not even a film or a vhs tape or a dvd it's just zeros and ones that are playing on a file that i somehow watch on my phone or my laptop or my device or my my big screen tv but it's not anywhere yeah you know it's not something i can hold in my hand anymore yeah which is wild <laughs> when you say it like that. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. like a, you, you, you kind of like shrug. My daughter knows nothing else but that. Yeah. And it's not new to her, but well, it's new. When, just personally, was, you know, in my other life where I write books, I mean, I've still had all four of my novels that come out in print. And to get a hardcover edition of the book is amazing. And to feel it and to have it tangible, be able to put it on my shelf and, to, you know, go to a reading and have people buy it. But, I mean, I've sold far more Kindle editions. Of yeah, well, you're, a, you know, you're in... You know, you're in journalism. And now, yeah, Daily Memphian. I, I mean, mean, yeah, exactly. How I, I, I think I was in the paper because like my daughter's film and my film were being released on the same day. I went hunting yeah. for a paper yeah. to just keep in my archive and I couldn't find one. I finally yeah. found one at a Walgreens, right. you know, uh, near the freeway, yeah. but I had to go <laughs> looking for a newspaper. Yeah. And uh, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's the same thing. I think that so when people say, like, is it, you know, you asked earlier, like, is it only on streaming? I was like, well, what else is there that you're thinking that it would be on? <laughs> like, yeah. what is that? Yeah. Th that people are going like, oh, is it only on streaming? I was like, yeah, but what are you saying it would be on other than streaming? Because even network television, I'm finding. People are streaming it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, my kids are 25-ish. Yeah, they're not watching yeah. NBC, but it, they might watch Peacock. Here's I mean, also something know. interesting is that um, in the old days, not the old days, even today, when a movie's coming out into movie theaters, 
the advertising budget that you're going to use to sell that movie, you drop 70% of your advertising budget the week before the movie comes out. Which is insane. Right. So you're buying a lot of TV ads, a lot of radio ads this Friday and then tonight, you know, and then finally like this weekend, the number one movie in America, you know, that all those things that you see, that's the most money that they're spending on that because they want to make sure that you're there on opening night of that weekend because that's how they tally success is that opening weekend. Netflix and Amazon and all the other streaming platforms, when they're premiering a movie, they spend 70% of their marketing dollars after in the week after it's premiered because they want to create this element of access. So I don't know if you remember, but there was, remember when like, Everybody was going like, hey, have you seen this movie Bird Box that Sandra Bullock is in? And people go like, no. When's it coming out? Oh, no, it's on Netflix right now. Yeah, yeah. So there isn't this like, oh, I got to wait for it. They they market it in terms of like, oh, no, it's happening. You've, you're, you're out of the conversation already. You need to go watch it. And that's kind of where we are right now. Is it from you, from <clears throat> circling back with a couple minutes left, <clears throat> creatively... Does it change things? Does this create more opportunities, less opportunities, or does it just shift the landscape? And I mean, still- I think I, I have to <clears throat> believe ultimately it's created more opportunities because the reality is, is that the, 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 the business of Hollywood is only reacting to the marketplace. And so when people say like, oh, they're not making any, I mean, I will, a, a little game that I play when I go to see a new movie is I count how many trailers have previous IP. Oh, yeah. So am I watching a sequel? Am I watching a remake? Am I watching something that was like a comic book? Am I, uh, you know... And, it's overwhelmingly and, what's in the, the it, mainstream it, theaters, right? right. I mean, but that's totally our doing. Yeah. Our doing meaning the viewer. Because I went to Paradiso this weekend to see the movie Strange Darling. I'm looking at a blank face. I don't yeah, even think don't. you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Uh, I also went to this movie called uh, Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah. I haven't seen it, but yeah. Well, right. Yeah. But see, that's the, that's kind of where we are, that it's the IP is ultimately going to draw people to, to big theaters. But when it comes to more interesting movies, it's probably going to be on yeah. streaming. There's yeah. it, because now you feel that the risk is lower uh, and you can enjoy it at home and people, you know, suddenly people will be like talking about Saltburn or something, some movie. And they're just like, Oh my God, it's, it was on this. I streamed it last night and you can have that conversation. Whereas to decide if you're going to spend like close to a hundred dollars to maybe go to a movie theater and eat popcorn and, you know, and have a date, it's, it's yeah. a, it's a risk. And so that, it, so I feel that it, streaming provides opportunities. Um, we're pretty much out of time. But now that maybe I'll have you back, <laughs> we can talk about more stuff. Sure. Uh, you, you mentioned a pro- upcoming project you can't talk about, so maybe we can come get you back when that's when that's happening. And, Most definitely, and we can talk about it. But thanks so much for doing this. The question I always ask everybody, or try to ask at the end, the first concert you ever went to. Well, um, I, I I know what it is. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, um, it's it's Willie Nelson. Nice. Uh, and it's, uh, no, it was in California. It was at an outdoor concert that my mom and my auntie brought me to. And, uh, I'll never quite, uh, forget it. I was up close. It was blazing hot. I was 12. I was up there with my aunt. And this was back when like the, the, the hell's angels, uh-huh. uh, were the uh, security guards or, yeah. or it was a, a big part of Willie Nelson's world. Right. And I don't know if you've ever been to a Willie Nelson concert, but it starts with him singing whiskey river and the, the Texas flag drops behind him. And at that moment, all the biker girls got up on their soldier, on their guys' shoulders and took their tops off and <laughs> water guns were coming out. And I just remember thinking, like, I, I am different. <laughs> I, am, I, I am having an experience here. So I remember I can't listen to Whiskey River and not thinking of, about that moment in my uh, yeah. young adult life yeah. of going, wow, where, what is this? Thing, that's, this concert that's you know? very good that's so good. i don't know if that, i don't know if you can put that on oh on yeah radio, we can put but that. <laughs> yeah, definitely a, we can definitely yeah we may <laughs> that's pre- use that first, as a preview that's so, my yeah. first concert experience all right well craig brewer thanks so much for doing this that is all the time we have this week uh if you missed any of the episode you can get it at the wyxr website or on the daily memphian or wherever you get your podcasts thanks very much and we'll see you next week <laughs>